Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com. It's Thursday, June 9th. This is The Gateway. I'm Wayne Pratt. Youth activists in Missouri are sounding the alarm about the dire consequences of climate change. They are demanding lawmakers and institutions take action. Climate change is on our minds basically every hour of the day. <laughs> like, I'm looking at things and I'm always thinking about, like, how can this be more efficient? And, like, what are the impacts of this? But I cannot solve climate change on my own. We'll have that story from St. Louis Public Radio's Shayla Farzan in just a few minutes. St. Louis County Executive Sam Page says a federal indictment shows processes in place for distributing COVID relief money are working. St. Louis Public Radio's Rachel Littman has more on the ongoing fallout of a major corruption investigation. Anthony Weaver, a now former St. Louis County employee, is accused of helping a small business owner submit fraudulent applications for a first round of COVID relief dollars in exchange for a share of the grants. The businesses in question did not receive any money. Page says the indictment is terrible news, but he says it vindicates his decision to have law and accounting firms review the applications. We can't stop people from trying to steal from the county government, but we can try and uh, we can set up policies and procedures that make it very difficult. The charges in the county may be related to a bribery scandal in the city of St. Louis that has forced the resignation of three aldermen. I'm Rachel Lippman. St. Louis Public Radio. Page yesterday also stated that a rise in coronavirus cases in St. Louis County is not likely to trigger a mask mandate. County and St. Louis City officials have issued strong recommendations for people to wear masks while inside public places or outside in crowds. The region is currently at a high rate of transmission and hospitalizations are also at a high level, but Page says there are no plans to reinstate a countywide restriction. Missouri's attorney general is issuing subpoenas to seven school districts, including Melville and Webster Groves, as part of an investigation into curriculum and district practices. The action by Eric Schmidt is focusing on surveys involving race, politics, and sexuality. His office says they could have involved unnecessary questions. The Missouri Independent reports the investigation appears to have been sparked by a request from the Southeastern Legal Foundation. Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker is defending the Department of Children and Family Services, but admits there are many challenges. His comments follow a report showing the state child welfare agency is increasingly leaving kids in juvenile jail because it has nowhere else to house them. Alex Degman has more. Cook County data show last year the state left 84 kids in jail for an average of 53 days beyond the release date. Pritzker has long blamed systemic issues at DCFS that predated his administration, but as he has said before, they're working on it. You don't think that the budgets that we put together and the effort that's been put in, um, you know, is designed to solve the problem? Of course it is. Pritzker says the state has added about 100 more beds for kids with specialized needs, but more are still needed. In the meantime, he says kids need to be kept where they'll be safe. I'm Alex Degman. The St. Louis County Public Library System is one of three to receive the highest honor for libraries in the nation. As St. Louis Public Radio's Jeremy Goodwin reports, the National Medal for Museum and Library Services honors the system for expanding social services during the pandemic. The National Medal recognizes St. Louis County libraries for distributing free meals, diapers and period supplies, laptops and tablets, and hosting COVID-19 vaccine clinics. Library staff worked with the St. Louis Area Diaper Bank, Digital Equity Initiative, and other organizations. Kristen Sorth is director and CEO of the library system. When people are trying to figure out how to solve a problem, they often come to the library. It's a place where people are there to help you. Sorth laid off 122 part-time library employees in August 2020 after suspending some services. She refilled those positions when libraries fully reopened the next year. I'm Jeremy Goodwin, St. Louis Public Radio. Teenagers and young adults have experienced record-breaking temperatures for much of their lives. The last eight years have been the hottest ever recorded, with heat waves around the globe and other extreme weather events. As St. Louis Public Radio's Shayla Farzan reports, that has spurred young Missouri activists to take action. 
When Allison Fabrizio was growing up in New Jersey, she spent a lot of time outside, in the garden, climbing trees, picking up seashells on the beach. But as she got older, she began to notice more extreme weather. In 2011, when Fabrizio was nine, Hurricane Irene hit New Jersey, the first time a hurricane had made landfall in the state in more than a century. The following year came Superstorm Sandy. This freakishly powerful October storm will go down as one of the most colossal weather events of its kind of all time. This storm is so big, so vast, 60 million Americans will feel its power. The storm slammed into the coast, causing billions of dollars in damage and widespread flooding in Fabrizio's hometown. Since I've been around so many natural disasters that have caused damages to our town, I think that really makes people here more aware of the effects of climate change. Climate change is driving more intense hurricanes with heavier rainfall and higher wind speeds. That worries Fabrizio, a 20-year-old junior at Washington University. She has family in St. Vincent and Grenada, two island nations in the Caribbean that are especially vulnerable to climate change. People who are marginalized, people who are women of color, they're the most affected. They're the ones that are experiencing the worst of climate change. So I think it's my sort of my duty to advocate for those people. Fabrizio has volunteered with the Sierra Club and Citizens Climate Lobby, pushing lawmakers to institute carbon pricing, which charges companies for their carbon dioxide emissions. She's part of a growing movement of young adults who are concerned about the climate. A poll from the Kaiser Family Foundation and The Washington Post found 7 in 10 teenagers and young adults in the U.S. said climate change will harm their generation. And one in four said they had taken action on the issue, like contacting elected officials or attending a rally. Hundreds of teenagers in the St. Louis region skipped school in 2019 as part of the global climate strike. They rallied in front of City Hall downtown, calling for the state and federal government to transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Some youth climate activists say the amount of time left to address climate change is dwindling, and they're frustrated with what they see as complacency among lawmakers and others in positions of power. 17-year-old Eve Rosenblum of St. Louis says her parents' generation isn't taking climate change seriously enough. As we're young people and we experience climate change as much more of a burden that we are terrified of, you know, as we get older, it's a little unreal to not feel like they cared as much or that it was something that affected them, knowing that their children would have to face this. Rosenblum graduated this spring from Metro Academic and Classical High School, a public school in St. Louis. She says climate change is making existing inequality worse. I think about, you know, the elderly person waiting for the bus at a shelter that doesn't provide any shade on a 90 degree July day that will soon be a 100 degree July day and a 110 degree July day. And I'm extremely concerned about that. Earlier this year, Rosenblum organized a climate summit between students from her high school and others from St. Clair High School in Franklin County. She says many of the St. Clair students came from farming families who were experiencing the effects of climate change firsthand, including more intense droughts and flooding. The two groups of students agreed that climate change is a major issue, but they didn't come to a consensus on solutions. Scientists overwhelmingly agree that human activity is driving climate change. But Mizzou graduate Emma Heinekel says sometimes she meets people who reject that when she gives presentations to schools and Catholic parishes. It's the people that aren't aware or maybe don't consider climate change to be real. That's the people that we need to target our efforts towards and try to figure out what their perspective and their experiences are and share our own. Heinekel grew up in St. Charles, and she says she started thinking seriously about climate change after her high school teacher gave her a copy of Laudato Si, a 2015 letter by Pope Francis in which he calls climate change, quote, one of the principal challenges facing humanity. Those words resonated with Heinekel and helped encourage her to study atmospheric and environmental science at Mizzou, work that she says closely aligns with her faith. 
there's a verse in the Bible where God calls all people to have dominion over the earth. And dominion, often people have seen that word as to have control over. But dominion is to mean to nurture, to take care of, to tend to. Though many young climate activists agree that taking personal responsibility for your impact is important, they say holding powerful institutions and individuals accountable is also critical. Mandy Huang helped create the Washington University Decarbonization Coalition, a group of students lobbying administrators to commit to specific goals that will help the university achieve carbon neutrality. WashU is like a major employer in the state of Missouri. Um, we're definitely a large energy consumer, and I think like we need to take responsibility for our impact. More than three dozen undergraduate and graduate groups have joined the effort to push WashU to take action on climate change. Huang is a recent WashU graduate who grew up in Sykeston. She says the anxiety her generation has about climate change can become overwhelming. Climate change is on our minds basically every hour of the day. <laughs> like, I'm looking at things and I'm always thinking about, like, how can this be more efficient? And, like, what are the impacts of this? But I cannot solve climate change on my own. I am going to do whatever I can. And that's all I can do. For Huang and other young climate activists, trying to raise the alarm about climate change and make progress can be discouraging at times. But working with others who care about this rapidly unfolding crisis motivates them to keep going. I'm Shayla Farzan, St. Louis Public Radio. Our David Casares edited that report, which is the last story from Shayla at St. Louis Public Radio. She is moving on to her next career chapter. Shayla has been a reporter, pinch hit editor, and fill-in newscaster during the past four and a half years. Her outstanding reports will stick with us for a while. That includes last year's investigation about winter homeless deaths in the city of St. Louis. He says another man froze to death right beside him. Came back and he was blue. I thought he was asleep, but he was dead. This is not the only instance of a homeless person dying from the cold in St. Louis. In 2019, she examined the trend of different uses for old places of worship. Danny Ball is the co-owner of Cafe on the Abbey in Columbia, Illinois, which used to be the convent of Immaculate Conception Catholic Church. Last year, it became a coffee shop. The owners are leaning in to the history of the building. There are images of nuns everywhere, even in their logo, which is a nun drinking coffee. We've been very playful with that, playful and respectful. The cafe is one piece of a multi-million dollar development. And one of my favorite reports by Shayla is from 2018. It involves two words, goat yoga. The goats don't always behave. Sometimes they start nibbling on the yoga mats or headbutting each other. One goat even rifled around in a participant's purse while her back was turned. Reporting on some cool stuff while never losing sight of the stories that need to be told, no matter how tough they might be to listen to. That might best describe Shayla's time at the station and our website. She's awesome, and we wish her all the best. Shula Newman is the executive editor of St. Louis Public Radio, a listener-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Music by Ryan McNeely of Adult Fur. I'm Wayne Pratt. This has been The Gateway. Support comes from Missouri Forest Products Association, committed to sustainable and sound conservation of the state's forests, which support more than 41,000 Missouri jobs, resulting in a $10 billion industry. Choosewood.com.